Hine matovu manaim shevet achim ve'achot be'yachad. How good and how pleasant it is when brothers and sisters come together. It is one of the greatest honors for me, Rabbi Elliot Cosgrove, the rabbi of Park Avenue Synagogue, to exist in an ecosystem of synagogues on the Upper East Side of Manhattan with my dearest and nearest friends who are also congregational rabbis leading communities of distinction, dynamic, engaged communities that are models for all of America and frankly, all around the world. Rabbi Chaim Steinmetz is a dear, dear friend. He is the congregational rabbi. He's been a congregational rabbi for nearly 30 years, having served pulpits in Montreal, Quebec, and Mount Vernon, and now New York at Keilat Jeshurun. He's always been deeply engaged in community affairs, and he currently serves on the board of directors of UJA Federation of New York. I am not going to go through his entire bio other than to say <laughs> that the model of his rabbinate is a model for his entire community and all of us. Rabbi Angela Warnick Bookdahl serves as a senior rabbi of Central Synagogue here in New York City, the first woman to lead Central's Reform Congregation in its 180 year history. Rabbi Bookdahl first joined Central Synagogue as senior cantor in 2006. In 2014, she was chosen by the congregation to be its senior rabbi. Rabbi Bookdahl has been nationally recognized for her innovations in leading worship, which draw crowds in the congregation's historic main sanctuary and live stream to viewers around the world. And more important than their credentials on paper are their neshamas, their souls, and their friendship and collegiality. We are blessed to have such warm relationships, to be all together, and, and, and to sit with you both and to be in dialogue, this is a dialogue, all of us together, thanks to the good works of JBS, which we're honored to be mm -hmm. part of this dialogue. Um, well, it's, wait, Elliot, we, I don't have we don't Well, you can say nice things to me, me but, but I think we also have to introduce the, you as, you said you're the rabbi of Park Avenue Synagogue, but I would call it really the most dynamic, leading conservative congregation and um, with just the deepest engagement with Israel, the deepest kind of sense of community you have built, um, such a vibrant community there and it really feels like it has affected not just all of us on the east side in new york city but just it has it has reverberated and been a model for con congregations around the country so it is uh, also Thanks. such a gift to be your colleague and friend in this thank you so this is a it's almost a living room conversation we talk all the time so i'm a little bit in therapy here <laughs> but so so i'm getting ready for the high holidays but, but let me ask you, my colleagues and my friends who are leading these congregations of distinction, um, Angela, how do you prepare yourself for the high holidays? So I, I always feel like this, uh, once I hit Elul, um, I always say like with Elul comes uh, stomach unrest. <laughs> but I, I think that um, one of the things I love about this time is I get to in some ways live out the fantasy of the world I thought I would be inhabiting as a rabbi, which is the world of studying and text and ideas. Like I get to in some ways block everything else out and say I'm going to focus most of my attention on preparing a message or two that I feel like I get to send out into my wider Jewish community. And so I love kind of thinking about sermon topics early in the spring. And then I like kind of collect my articles and books and people I want to talk to. And I kind of immerse in that, um, in these ideas for a little while. That was sort of the fantasy of what I thought rabbis got to do all the time. In reality, as we know, that's not really what we get to do most of the time. But for a month, I kind of get to inhabit that world as a rabbi, as a learner and teacher, um, which I love. Of course, in addition to that, there are multiple cue meetings, you can't believe, Rosh Hashanah cues, Yom Kippur cues, music rehearsals that I'm still a part of, even though I'm the rabbi, but I used to be the cantor, so they, the, the cantors are generous enough to let me still sing every once in a while. And, um, and I think in terms of the deeper internal work, I actually make a point of um, sitting with every member of my family and um, mm. just talking about the last year, asking for forgiveness for the things that I know I'm still working on. Um, and I do that with a few of my close colleagues as well. So I do try to um, do the message that we try to 
ask our own congregants to do. Um, I think that sometimes I do it with more patience and more presence and energy um, than other years, but I really do try to make that a part of my preparation as well. Thank you. What about you, Chaim? Chaim, what about you? How do so, you do this? So it's, it's really interesting. You know, you, you, you made reference to Elul. And uh, I remember a congregant telling me a Yiddish phrase that his father would repeat to him every year on Elul, which is, in Elul, their fish zittert in Wasser, which means in Elul, the fish is trembling in water. <laughs> and, and, and that's the experience you have, actually, mm -hmm. when, when you're studying in yeshiva. You're, you're, you're constantly thinking every day is Elul. Mm -hmm. Every day you're, you're thinking about how do you prepare yourself spiritually. And then you become a rabbi. And the rabbinate, Elul, is a working time. Yes. You know, you were referring to, you know, getting the, the sermons together. And, you know, where, where does the inspiration for the sermon come from? And it's very haphazard. It's just sometimes like a lightning bolt. Oh, I see something. I read something. And it kind of inspires you. But you're so focused on setting up the congregation mm. that I don't do the things that I used to do to focus on myself. And I, I've always, you know, in moments of reflection, and I, I think about it, I say, I'm really not focused on Elo. Mm. I'm focused on my job. And sometimes I feel a little bit guilty about it. I don't know how, how the two of you feel mm. about this, but this is one of the really deep questions is how do you prepare for Elul? How do you prepare for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? And all I can say is, well, those are work times for mm. me. That's when I'm working. Mm -hmm. right. What about you, Elliot? Right. Look, I, first of all, it's incredibly comforting to hear your answers because <laughs> your angst and your, you know, balancing your own personal cheshbon hanefesh, you know, the, the accounting of the soul, but also your professional responsibilities, I do it too. Mm -hmm. um, my, my, I mean, my kids have a joke that during Elul, the, the month preceding uh, Russia, I'm an absentee parent, right? <laughs> I'm just not around. They, they don't see me because whether or not it's logistics at the synagogue, whether or not it is uh, me spending late nights writing sermons or otherwise, you know, it is um, the rabbinate uh, on steroids. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, People still are born and die. There's still brisses and weddings and otherwise. So it's not like the whole world says, don't bother Rabbi Cosgrove. He's preparing for <laughs> the high holidays. But, you know, Angela, to, to think about, you know, this, you know, it, it, it's a process that forces you to essentialize things, you know, to ask what's important. Yes. What's important? What's important to me? Who is the person? I seek to be, and then to ask what is important for the congregation to hear. Um, because I know, and maybe we'll talk about this more, I, I know that um, many people, um, that's their moment, that they, 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 they focus in on, on, on their Jewish identities. And so you got to let them know what's important, whether that is what's going on globally, for the Jewish community, the Jewish people, or what are those essential uh, questions facing all of humanity, or, or perhaps a message that is more about our souls, mm. um, about what the critical questions we need to ask ourselves. Um, and, and I think earlier in my career, I used to um, find that tension to be more untenable that, you know, I was busy writing sermons and and then on the holidays, you know, when's my high holidays? But now I realize it is my high holidays because mm -hmm. hopefully if I do my job right, the questions I'm asking of myself are the questions that I'm sharing with my community. You want them to be asking as well. That's yeah. beautiful. I've been thinking about the fact that we call these days, intermediary days in this kind of season, the days of awe. And I think that we've lost a little touch with that sense of awe in the way our ancestors thought of it. Like it used to be there was no higher compliment than to be God-fearing, to feel yira, like both fear and awe, this sense that you kind of felt the majesty, the, the trembling. Um, I think that that feeling that our ancestors wanted us to have, there's no better embodiment of that fear than the Unatana Tokif prayer, the prayer, mm -hmm. who by water, who by fire, um, and a sense that this is a day that we should be trembling like fish and in the water. And I think um, it's also one of the most complicated and 
hard theological prayers for us to wrap our head around. Um, you know, we're looking at fires that are happening in Hawaii, uh, killing record numbers of people for wildfires. And we think, is God making that happen? Is this a choice? Uh, and, I, and I wonder, how do you reconcile this kind of most awesome, fearful prayer, uh, kind of in the context of a time where we're supposed to feel that, I think in an era where people don't seek out awe and fear and trembling in the same way. What is the role of that? I don't know if either of you want to start. Well, I mean, I, I would just sort of jump in and say, I mean, I mean certainly in the Tokef, it takes a very traditional vision of God's involvement in this world. And we, we could discuss that. We, we probably would, would have different views on that. But what is so critical about, about Unatana Tokef is that it reminds us that we all are going to die. Mm. And while that's a thought that no one wants to take part in, I, I think it's even impossible for us to fully envision that possibility. Mm. But it's very difficult, or in fact, to learn how to live, one must remember that they're going to die because then you see the world very differently. Yeah. And the beauty of Unitana Tokef, which has all sorts of connections to Ashkenazic Judaism and martyrdom, which is really a lot of the themes of Unitana Tokef, but the beauty of it is, is that it tries to shake us for just a moment and remind us we're not immortals. Mm -hmm. We are going to die. We need to actually get things done before that happens. And that is the ultimate message, I believe, of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Life is short. You need to prioritize, as Rabbi Cosgrove was saying. We need to make sure that we get things done now. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. Look, I, when I was earlier in my career, for the second time in this conversation, I had real trouble with the theology. Mm -hmm. Because I, I just don't believe this idea that God is a vending machine in the sky, insert good deed here, outcome there. I know, we all know, right? This is the year that, uh, that Rabbi Harold Kushner passed away when bad things happened to good mm -hmm. people. We all know um, of the injustices of the world of, of bad things happening to good people. But, but then Chaim, my, my take on it now is, is akin to yours, right? Mi, mi amut mi yichyeh, who will live, who will die, mi ba'esh, u mi ba'magefa, who by fire, who by a plague. We don't know. We don't know who in the year to come is going to live and who is going to die. And um, that is, that is um, not easy. That is not easy. And so, um, you know, a, a wonderful interpretation, I, I don't remember to whom to, to credit it, is the, the, the rejoinder after that paragraph that tells us Uchuva, Utfila, Utstaka. Mavirin um, et roa hagzera that that it, it um, that acts of of repentance of prayer and of charitable giving um, it doesn't remove the decree the decree is not in our power but the 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 difficulty the the roa the 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 bitterness of that decree that we can still live lives of purpose, of meaning, of chesed, of kindness, of sadaka, of good deeds, um, in spite of the, the, the precarious nature of life. And, and just the last thing that the, the three of us all share, um, and I'd be curious to know uh, how this feels for you, as, as congregational rabbis, I stare out at my community at that moment, right? I know that there are people who are in our community mm -hmm. who were there last year who are not there. And I know, because I've been doing this for a while, that next high holidays, there are going to be people sitting in that room who are not going to be sitting in that room in the year to come. And so for me, as, as a pastor, that prayer has taken on all sorts of different dimensions. Mm, that's powerful. I, mean, I think that uh, I find that prayer to be one of the more important challenges of the holiday um, because we are a people who especially now want to exert control over our lives. We want to feel like we are the master of our destiny. And I think that um, actually that brings a lot of pain because the reality is there is a mystery. <laughs> and there is, while there are some things within our control, there are some 
very big things that are not in our control, and of course that includes when we die. And you know, I think that um, one of the most beautiful interpretations of this prayer I learned from my teacher, Rabbi Maggie Wenig, who talked about these kind of conflicting truths that are held in this prayer. If you think about, on the one hand, you've got God inscribing all of our deeds, but then on the other hand, it says that it bears our hatima, our signature. Mm. So in some ways, is it God writing it or is it we are writing it? And I think, you know, my interpretation of that is that um, we are doing the acts and we put our imprint on it and God is just recording what we've done. So in some ways, it's not predetermined. We still have some control and yet some not control. We talk about us being sheep but then we're reminded that God is our shepherd who mm. numbers us and makes sure that every single one of us is is known and you know and the shepherd would carry the weakest sheep you know in the flock um, we're told that we're like dust and ashes a flower that fades a grass that withers we are a nothing um, and yet at the very very end of the prayer it says but you've linked your name with ours so while we are nothing and our bodies are mortal we're gonna be linked to something eternal and forever. Mm -hmm. So I, I find the richness of those tensions just captures, I think, the reality of our lives, that we have control over some things and we don't have control of some of the biggest things, that we can feel lost and, um, you know, and part of a mass, and we can also know that God knows each one of us, that we can recognize our mortality and also recognize that we're linked to something that lasts way beyond us. And mm -hmm. I think, um, Wow, is that a message that I still think that we need for today? That um, that we, uh, in our sort of controlling mortal lives, in our search for kind of immortality, which I think we are all kind of looking for in a way, it gives us an, it gives us a deep Jewish answer. Isn't that sort of part of what a faith community is to be connected to something that transcends yes. just your Each, own personhood? Your individual, absolutely. Maybe that's yeah. the biggest thing that we're here for. Right. I mean, I, I, I would just say, like, that I think is, is perhaps the comfort that we're saying all of this together. I mean, you were talking about that you look out into the congregation, and I know that there are people who are reading this prayer who've just lost someone. Right. And it's kind of coming and forcing them yeah. to think about it. But, uh, you know, something that Angela said that I really think really sort of fits with the perspective that I think rabbis have that maybe a lay person doesn't always have, which is that we are in close contact to mortality all the time. Yes. Because we go to funerals all the time. And I would say one of the turning moments in, in my life was in my early 30s, when I was newly minted as a rabbi of a large congregation in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And over two years, Within the congregation or the extended family of the congregation, we had six extraordinarily tragic funerals. Mm. A, a, a nine-year-old who died suddenly, a 27-year-old who died with a, due to a mistake in an operation, and four other 30-year-olds who died with cancer. Mm. And rabbis, everyone perceives them as being on the outside, but we're really on the inside. And I struggled a great deal. Mm. I, I think, I don't know what you were like in your 30s. When I was in my 30s, I didn't think I was ever going to die. Mm -hmm. I really didn't. And I struggled with it so much. And the comfort that, that both of you have been talking about of sort of eventually sort of going back into community, going back into your family and saying, maybe this isn't forever. Maybe I'm always going to you know, wake up one day and find out that something awful is happening because that's just the reality of life. Even so, I have a community with me mm -hmm. and that's everlasting. I have a family with me, which hopefully is everlasting. And that, that gives you the greatest comfort. Yes, and we're part of a larger story that's everlasting. I think that does bring a lot of comfort. I think uh, you're reminding me of like, you know, I. I've been thinking a lot about awe since reading this book on the science of awe. And um, not surprisingly, you know, um, this, this scientist studies 26 cultures with like thousands of people and, and kind of makes a taxonomy of eight different things that most inspire wonder in human beings. And not a surprise to any of us, I think, here. Rabbi's um, sermons. <laughs> <laughs> that was number one. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, 
death and birth. We, we, we hit a lot of death and birth in our lives. That is one of the top um, uh, reasons, wonders, I think, that invoke awe. Um, religious experience can be. I don't know if it's our sermon, but maybe the experience of praying in a whole group of people together and being with just a lot of people in kind of prayer and song and that religious experience is one of them. Nature is one of them. I think that's one of the ones that's easiest for a lot of our people to access. I'm on a mountaintop. I'm on the edge of the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but I was surprised by the number one source of awe, according to this scientist anyway. Um, I wasn't surprised once I thought about it, but it wasn't one I would have guessed. And it was the idea of moral beauty, which is the idea that um, human beings are able to do extraordinary acts of, of courage or kindness mm. or resilience or sacrifice, grit, overcoming. We know these stories. And you know, it occurred to me as I was reading the book that one of the maybe the greatest privilege of being a rabbi is that we are in the awe business that i that we are exposed to moral beauty of our congregants every day that we are much closer to death and birth by the way uh, than most people on a regular basis that we are of course trying to create religious experience we're trying to create musical experience that's another one of the wonders of course music um, that basically our daily work is to try to help people notice the awe, feel the awe, and, mm -hmm. and, and just be exposed to it. In addition to the fact that like just the volume of awe that is coming through our lives as, as religious leaders, is it constantly kind of brings us out of the self. Because the experience of awe reduces our sense of our own ego mm -hmm. and, and, and reminds us that we're part of something much bigger than ourselves. I, I really, that comes back mm -hmm. to what you said before about what is religion all mm -hmm. about. It's like feeling like you're part of something bigger. So I don't know, I guess I'd ask you at this, in this season of awe, uh, when's been a moment, what's a moment that in recent days that you've felt awe? Oh, hmm. You'll have to start with your answer. <laughs> we need to think about it, but whoa. Well, I, uh, look, I, I, go ahead. I don't know if it's awe, but is awe the same as gratitude? You know, I think it's very connected. I think it's that sense of recognizing a vastness. Either it's a spatial vastness or even a time continuum vastness. Mm -hmm. Or um, it's, it's, it's also touching something that you can't fully comprehend. Mm -hmm. That's why awe can also be scary, which is why there's also fear mm -hmm. and awe are basically uh, the same. I'll tell you what popped into my head, uh, which, I, and, and this is somewhat riffing off of the great theologian Abraham Joshua Heschel, which is the ability to see, uh, to be awed not just by the sunset or, or the, giant the things, Philharmonic yeah. or whatever, but to, to see awe uh, in the day-to-day, -day, mm -hmm. in the mundane. And so if I have uh, a quiet conversation, mm. if I, this past, uh, a week, my, my kids are scattered here and there, and they're empty nesting. Um, but if I have them all at the Shabbos table, mm -hmm. and I recognize um, uh, uh, how special that moment is, and I allow my soul to, to um, lean into that moment, mm. and to not sleepwalk through it, but to say, this is sacred. Yeah. Um, and and, and I think, again, Heschel said this far more beautifully than any of us, but I, I think um, we do run the risk sometimes of, of, of sleepwalking through mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, to just be present, um, I think, can induce awe in ways that too often we overlook. So, yeah. you know, so now that I've had a, a moment to think about it, <laughs> You know, it, it's interesting, you know, the Hasidic masters believed profoundly in the power of stories. Mm. And it, it's not just about listening to the story, but actually looking for the story. And they believed yeah. profoundly in the power of stories because they recognized that, so to speak, the divine speaks to us sometimes through history. Mm. And that there are ways of hearing God's voice through a story about something remarkable that allows you to hear God more loudly than it would be if someone just told you read the Torah. And you know, one story that, that 
I've shared with everyone here and I've shared widely was that this past Sunday I was at a wedding in Sao Paulo, Brazil and it was my aunt my aunt Lily's great granddaughter who got married mm -hmm. and my aunt Lily along with my mother and my other aunt Raleigh they the three of them survived the Holocaust together they were on a death march from Auschwitz in January 1945 they decided that the only way they would be able to survive together is if they made a break for it mm. and they did and they managed to be find a place that would hide them and they mm. survived the war and my aunt Lily went to Brazil and there she built a family and she's the one surviving sister of the three and here she is at this wedding and it's her great-granddaughter getting married mm. 78 years later and to me mm. well, that, that was <laughs> beyond awe mm. and the band was playing the words of the Shehachianu blessing which is thanking God for having lived until this point and I thought about that blessing and I just said to myself these words have never been truer mm. and that's a moment of awe it's a moment of seeing how the Jewish people continues to live on and for me it was a moment of incredible inspiration mm. Thank you. beautiful beautiful Chaim, let me ask you a question also as a as a fellow congregational rabbi do you, I mean every year we go through this this process <laughs> of the holidays right and and we come in and we say we're gonna repent and we're gonna you know make amends with our ourselves with our family with our friends our communities um, and then we go through it again and then again and every year we go in like what's going on here what what's the calculus of this are, are people actually capable of change um, what, what are we doing here um, and uh, what, what's your take on it? It's, it, it's <laughs> one that I, I actually started to think about also probably about 10 or 15 years in the career. Notice how all the rabbis are referencing when I was younger, <laughs> but about 10 or 15 years into my career, and I realized that I'm hitting on the same thing. We're talking about tshuva, about repenting. We're going to become better. We're going to become better. And there's no lightning bolt. Right, I used to tell the story of Franz Rosenzweig who wanted to convert out to Christianity and he goes to synagogue on Kol Nidre mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden he's inspired and he becomes one of the greatest Jewish thinkers of his era and he transforms his life and I'm looking at myself and every year I'm giving the same speech and looking in the mirror I'm in the same place and so I, I've grappled with this and mm -hmm. one of the things I think that needs to be pointed out. I mean, first of all, you could certainly change one little thing. Mm. And little things are never little because they have all sorts of magnitudes of influence on many other things. And certainly that's what I strive to do. Let's find one little thing we can change this year. But the thing I think that's more important about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and if there's anyone in the audience saying to themselves, okay, I've really been the same person for the last 30 years, and I go to synagogue every year and I'm still the same person, well, this is what they should probably think about, because that's what I think about. It's not so much about changing, it's mm. about being changeable. Mm. If we didn't have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we would never imagine that we could change. At least every year we keep alive within our hearts the possibility of change. And there will be moments where that change has to happen, whether it be in your relationships, whether it be in terms of your connection to God and to Judaism, there will be a moment. It may not happen in year one, it may not happen in year 10, it may not happen in year 20, but there is a moment where that's going to have to happen. So even if you're not changing on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you should still be able to be changeable, that you should be capable of that change when the time comes. And if we didn't have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, when that time would come, we wouldn't necessarily be ready. I, I love that answer, and I'm gonna, but I'm going to take a different take, because in some ways, tshuva, as we say, repentance, whatever, it's not just about change. 
let's use that language of it's actually about returning. And I think that is different because change makes it sound like you almost have to become something that you weren't or you have to change something about you. Return is a reminder that you're actually going back to something that's already who you are. So if you just imagine like you were born in this world, perfect, pure, good, like uh, healthy, we hope, you know, like, and the idea that like you're born kind of with that and that sort of goodness and purity of intention and all of that um, and wonder and everything that a, you can't look at a child and not see that goodness like that in, a, in, a, in an infant that like that's always been in us. We can just we just have to remind ourselves we have to return to it. And I found that like the change or the return that happens most effectively is often not like a big proclamation of change um, or return. It's usually a commitment to smaller habits that ultimately somewhere along the road you realize mm -hmm. something has changed. I mean, on a very kind of prosaic level, like I just like, I feel like, you know, I always wanted to be a person who like just took better care of my health and I would like, you know, make a big proclamation and like, this is the year that I'm going to do it. And then I realized at some point it just became about kind of like incremental habits that became over time, I realized, okay, now I finally feel like I'm, you know, a more healthy person. But it just took a long time. And I think that there are ways that we think of these things as like having to take massive efforts. And sometimes it's about small changes that kind of are incremental, 10%, 10%. And at some point, you realize you've actually made a lot of progress. Yeah. My colleague, uh, Rabbi Neil Zuckerman, whom I lead the community with, has a beautiful image. The guy's in better shape than any of us will mm -hmm. ever be in, <laughs> but he goes on a treadmill or his Peloton or whatever the guy does, and he um, said, if you just turn the dial like up 0.1, yes. if that, or 0.2, go from a 7 to a 7.2, he says, at the end, you'll realize that your time has dropped significantly or your distance has increased significantly so that over the, I'm long, just, haul. Over mm -hmm. the long haul so it's not about dramatic refashioning of the self it's just you know I'm I'm gonna call my brother once a week right mm -hmm. I'm gonna write a thank you note um, with more diligence I'm going to change a personal habit mm -hmm. or you know hold off the bread basket whatever <laughs> it might be that um, is is perhaps not transformative in the thunder lightning sense, right. but over time uh, is is going to be um, impactful on our lives and those around us. Yeah. I, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would just add. I mean, I've already answered this, but why not answer it twice? But <laughs> we're rabbis. <laughs> yes, you know, that's right. Not, you know, I, I I would just add Debar that there. maybe one of the the greatest things about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is that you should be capable of listening. Mm. Uh, one, of the th one of the things, and I've spoken about this on R Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur sermon, was I remember officiating at a funeral, and I was in Montreal, and my mom, my late mother at that time, lived in New York. And one of the children of the deceased got up and spoke about how, even though he lived out of town, he called his mother every day. Mm. Mm. And I thought to myself, I live out of town. Yeah. And I don't call my mother every day. Oh, yeah. So after the funeral, I got into my car, I pulled out my phone, and I called my mother. And then I would call her every single day. Mm. And I think that maybe one of the things about Rosh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is maybe the change isn't going to happen now. But at least you should have you leave your ears open that when you hear a message, you say to yourself, let's do this. So talking about those little things, yeah. sometimes you just have to be listening for when that little thing comes up and how you can maybe change that, yeah. that, that small thing. Yeah. So Chaim, I'm, I'm one of, that was beautiful, and, but I'm not gonna let you off the hook because we're all friends here. That's what, <laughs> I don't know if everyone understands, but this is neither scripted and it's all done with friendship. But if I were to take your thesis to it's, it's an extended, this idea of changeability, then it also, would suggest that other people, right, part of the, the challenge of the High Holidays is to register that other people are capable of change, not just me. Yes. And so, um, 
Angela or Chaim, whoever, I don't know if I have the answer. Politics. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> if if the if the if the if if the high holidays are predicated on the notion that people are capable of change, then does that mean that that person who hurt us, um, that person who betrayed us, that person who has fallen short of our expectations? Do we have to give them another chance because they too are capable of change? I, I think the answer to that is of course yes, but it has to be that we feel a sincere uh, sincerity from them on their part that they actually want, that they have made some movement. And I think, you know, our tradition really, I do appreciate the way our tradition really forces that forgiveness to happen between the hurt parties, you know. I, we don't have a way, I remember reading a story about someone who was in jail for something that they had done and they said, you know, it, it's good between me and God. Well, in our tradition, if, if the hurt was between you and someone else, it's, it doesn't get to just be between you and God. It really, you had to at least make the effort with the other person on the other side. Um, and yet, if you make sincere effort three times, let's say Maimonides says this, and and, and they still reject it after three very deep, sincere um, approaches. Uh, after the third time, it's really then it's on them that they haven't forgiven. And so I think that there, uh, I absolutely think we need to give people the other chance, but they also have to, they have to take that step forward too. It can't just be that this is all, all on us. So I, I also offer a yes, but answer. <laughs> and I, I'm not going to start by quoting scripture or Talmud. I, I, I'd like to quote Peanuts, the cartoon. <laughs> w what's your take on Lucy putting the football there and Charlie Brown every time coming and taking a kick at it and the ball is pulled away? And I, I, I always think about that when, mm. when, when you think about forgiveness. Obviously, there has to be limits. And, and, and forgiveness is something profoundly idealistic. I think we are often too paranoid and, and too resentful to open up enough to give space for the other to ask forgiveness. But at the same time, we do need to protect ourselves. We can't constantly be running at mm. the ball. And I, I don't know, as a rabbi, I mean, I don't know what the balance is between accepting, and certainly if there's an authentic request for forgiveness, you need to embrace it. Even if you want to sort of say, nah, 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 I'm going to show you. You need to at least look at yourself and say, you know what, I can be nasty also. But at the same time, you need to be self-protective, you need to protect yourself. And, and it's finding that right balance. Uh, but I, I agree, forgiveness is, is more I mean, the forgiveness also is always a gift to yourself, right? The, the resentment that you is, carry doesn't hurt the other person. It, is, it uh, only hurts you because you're carrying that very heavy mood. Mm -hmm. But again, you need to be very careful about opening yourself up to a person who's caused you hurt in the past. At the same time, you don't want to be too closed and not be capable of forgiving. And it's finding the balance between those two positions. You're reminding me of a story of um, a congregant and her her husband was killed by a drunk driver, um, leaving her as a single mom with two relatively young kids. And I asked her about forgiveness as I was preparing for this High Holiday mm -hmm. Sermon on Forgiveness many years ago. And she said, I will never forgive him. And she says, and she said, and if you tell me as a rabbi that I have to forgive that man who killed my husband, oh, I'm gonna walk out of the synagogue. And <laughs> I remember, um, I was very, I will never forget that conversation. And I understood that in many ways for her, holding on to that anger was a way that she felt she was honoring the memory of her dead husband. And, and in many ways, it's not her place to forgive. You know, it, it, it was her husband that was harmed, although obviously she was as well and the whole family. But it was interesting. But I also really felt very much the way that that lack, her inability to forgive meant that she was carrying this weight um, and choosing to carry it through her life in a way that I knew was very hard. And you know, there's an expression, I don't know who it's attributed to, it's been attributed to many people 
on the interwebs, but um, that basically, you know, carrying and not forgiving is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Like, it, mm. it doesn't actually impact them. This is in many ways the forgiveness when we ultimately decide to grant it. It's not always because they deserve it. It's because it releases us. Um, I think that's a hard, it's a hard truth without wanting to expose yourself to become uh, hurt regularly after that either. Yeah. I don't know if I have anything to, to add to your beautiful reflections other than I think we should all be more forthcoming with apologies. <laughs> yeah. um, mm -hmm. I, I think we hold on to it. I think there's probably someone smarter than me could, you know, what it means and I'm giving control and I'm acknowledging my humanity and like, who cares? <laughs> like, just turn to that, you know, whether you were late for a meeting for, you know, or whether you were, um, you know, just you know, apologize and apologize and apologize. I think they're the most important words to say, I'm sorry. And it, it, it signals, right, if, if I've somehow, God forbid, Chaim hurt you and, uh, and I, I let you down, right? What am I doing by saying I'm sorry? I'm saying, Chaim, I respect you. Um, I acted in a way that fell short of how I believe friends should relate one to the other. I fell short of that. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And I hope you know that I know that that's not how I imagine our relationship to be. And now it's easy enough if you're just running late for a cup of coffee with a friend, but I think the principle remains in place now, whether or not, of course, then you can get into the complicated of what sins are beyond and otherwise. But, but I think that's, um, I, I think, you know, I also, you know, make sure before the high holidays that, um, you know, should there be anyone or any person with whom I've had a falling out with, right, how do you have that conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I, you know, earlier we were talking about the importance of listening. Right? And so you've fallen out with someone and you say, um, you know, we don't talk about, we don't, we don't relate to each other like we once did, let's say, for instance. Um, something happened. You always have to recognize that that person has their version of what happened, which is very different mm -hmm. than yours. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes in reconciliation, the most important thing to do is to listen right. and to say, I know my version, what was your version? Hmm. And then just listen and hear it. Um, and that's humbling and that can be painful and that can be anxiety producing because your version is totally different than their version. But, but unless you're willing to listen and make yourself vulnerable to someone else's story, truth, version, then then we have nowhere to go in terms of reconciliation. Right, and, and, and I think you're, you're sort of touching on that. There's, there's really two sides to the apology. It's, it's both the you and them. Uh, mm. and, and you know, there's a, a, a famous rabbinic question of do you have to apologize to the person if they've already said, I forgive you? Mm -hmm. And forgiveness is, is one of the goals of the apology. It's, mm. it's almost like you owe the person the dignity of hearing your apology. So they can forgive that. But then there's all of the other things that Elliot is talking about, mm. that the apology changes your perspective on the world. It changes your perspective on the other person, and it forces you to be humble, to be thoughtful, and to listen. And, and that's really like the two sides of, of, of what in Hebrew we call bakashat mechila, asking forgiveness, it's both about the other person and it's about yourself. It's about your own process of growth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't think you've asked us a question yet, Chaim. You I want to ask us something? I haven't asked you a question. Um, I have many questions. <laughs> uh, well, let's, let's do the prosaic one because we've already started this, this conversation. What are you thinking of talking about on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? Uh, without, you know, spoiler alert for, for congregants who mm. are watching this beforehand. But what, what sort of top, and, and, what is, and how did you arrive at that topic? Look, I, I think 
I, I don't know when JBS is gonna, you know, film this, but I, <laughs> I, I always look for anniversaries. And um, one of the things that I'm well aware of in the year 2023 is the anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. And I look at um, what a year it has been for Israel, for diaspora Israel relations, um, for um, frankly American Israel relations. And I know that, right, if there, as I said earlier, it's a one time a year people think Jewishly and to come in, what was it like? And I actually have my grandfather's sermons um, from oh, 1973 um, and amazing. that moment when the existential threat to Israel was external and now this year that the existential threat to Israel is internal a country tearing itself apart. And so I think, you know, for me, I know I'm gonna talk about Israel, the changing relationships, the tensions, I just have to figure out what I'm gonna say. Mm. Um, you know, we, that's a beautiful topic and that's gonna be amazing. I can't wait to read it. I read, I read your sermons every year, Elliot. And, um, and always learn. I do too. <laughs> I read them every uh, week. <laughs> <laughs> and I, as I do yours too, Haim, yeah. and um, I, I think that interestingly, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about what ChatGPT did hmm. to our understanding of what technology and AI means for our future. And this is not my area of specialty. In fact, I'm a slow adopter, but I think that it has raised questions about what it means to be human, fundamentally mm. human. And that's what I want to explore, you know, not does AI have a soul, but what does it mean when we've kind of, we kept, we kind of keep moving the target of how we are completely different than technology. Um, and it used to be about intelligence. And then when it surpassed our intelligence and could beat us in chess or could beat us in go, then suddenly we're like, okay, wait a minute. So we're gonna have to move this marker. And I think it's, it's raising very big questions about, um, who we are and what is at our core. So that is something I'm exploring. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to. I would. It's not. I'd like to say that I don't want to give away my thesis, but I don't actually know exactly mm -hmm. um, what I wh where where I want to land on that yet. So that's that's kind of the work. Yeah, I think this this year has been the year. It has been the year of of really really is. like understanding both the threats and opportunities of it in a very different way and in a way that challenges our sense of like who are we in this possible new universe? Mm. So that's... Right, and, and um, what does it mean to be B'Tselem Elohim in the image of God? Absolutely. If there's something a lot smarter than we are. Right. And by the way, these questions, not surprisingly, are ones that our ancestors have been grappling with for a long time. Mm. Not with AI, but with um, questions of like personhood of non-human beings. Like that's actually something that our tradition, we have stuff going back on the golem, like, Talmudic times, earlier times. So there's we. This is not mm. actually a new conversation. It's a new a new language for a conversation that's actually very old. So I, I think that that's going to. Yeah. It's surprising and good. Um, second second topic I really want to talk about is um, kind of uh, the big picture question about intermarriage and conversion, and that I think that just a light topic. A light topic of that. Something that f that I feel very uh, on a very personal level, but also in my community is a very very live topic. And honestly, there's language around uh, the threat of intermarriage and the role of conversion. Um, there's language that in some ways hasn't changed for at least 60 years. And, I, and I'm gonna propose that it's time for us to really radically change our approach to the way we mm. think about and talk about interfaith marriage and conversion. And so, um, and I think that some of this is gonna be about the way we think about people who are not Jewish in our midst and how we might relate to them. But a lot of this is gonna be about the way we have to think about our own Judaism as Jews. Um, I, it was sparked in one of these conversations with. You know, this is not an uncommon story I'm sure you've heard where, you know, someone says, I grew up in a kind of suburban synagogue. We talked a lot about the Holocaust and anti-Semitism and, you know, religious school was like fine. Uh, and my parents, they cared about being Jewish, but the sum total of what they said it meant to be a good Jew is marry a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> and that's not an unusual story. Mm. But when your only mandate 
of what it is to be a Jew is to marry another Jew. There's a thinness of like what it actually means. And I don't actually think that that's what we're saying. What we, if we really want Jewish continuity, the language actually needs to be about something different than that. So I think that's um, a conversation that's been very live for me for a while, but I wanted to talk about. So that's going to be the other topic. I, I, a little I scary. Certainly... I, I, I feel like a good sermon is one that scares the heck out of you a little bit. And <laughs> that one does. Yeah, no, As does I, AI, I, frankly. I, I certainly look forward to it. So, so actually, because we were on an interfaith mission, uh, to Israel, uh, which we don't have the time to talk about, but maybe in another program. But we were there, and, and I, you and I had a conversation about also the, the anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, and that was like one of those lightning moments where I said, I absolutely have to talk about 50 years since the Yom Kippur War, mm. because I was a child then, and I just remember that morning, because again, mm. we're an Orthodox family, we, there's, there's no there's no media, and yet everyone knew by the next morning in synagogue. Mm. And after that, even on Shabbat, people kept their radios on mm. to listen to the every single news break, every mm. single time that there was breaking news, because there was real fear. And I, 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 I was thinking about that, and you know, one of the most powerful influences on me regarding the Yom Kippur War was a book called in Hebrew, Tiyum Kavanot, or Adjusting Sites, which was written by Rabbi Chaim Sabato, uh, which is a story of his own experience where he loses his best friend mm. during the mm. war. And this idea of adjusting your vision, which is that he was a very religious young man and he had to adjust his vision and look at, at the world differently. I, I think that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk mm. about disappointment, I want to talk about what happens when your dreams crash, when you expect that God is there and shining mm. his countenance upon you, and then all of a sudden he disappears. Mm. And that I think is, is, is a topic that's so critical, the topic of disappointment, uh, because things are generally very good on the Upper East Side. And mm -hmm. people, because of that, they're not ready when disappointment hits mm. and how, and I don't have this fully fleshed out, but how disappointment can be something that's inspiring. Now the other sermon topic I'm thinking of, and I haven't quite worked this out, but it has to do with a newspaper story that written by Elie Wiesel in 1964, where he heard that there was an atheist rabbi and he said, you have to meet this atheist rabbi mm. because he was grappling with God and he was wrestling with God. And he was, of course, thoroughly disappointed because he felt that it was, this rabbi was very superficial. Mm. And I want to talk a little bit about what are the gateways to Judaism if you're an atheist? And mm. is there some connection to holiness that even those who say, well, I don't accept God, I don't believe in God, is there, for those in, in the room or who have friends who are outside of the room, is there a gateway for them? And this is obviously a challenging topic, but mm. it's one it. that I'm really thinking about as well. Mm. Well, when I was in Israel through Hartman, I've, I've met a whole cadre of rabbis who call themselves Hiloni rabbis, uh, secular rabbis. And that's not the same as atheists, but many of them would probably consider themselves that. But, but in, a, in, kind of, in our kind of American mindset, it feels like an oxymoron. How can you be a secular rabbi? A rabbi is by definition, a religious figure. So um, it is, I think it means something very different in Israel, but I do think that like kind of balancing and separating out sort of the moral, ethical, uh, and the sort of sacred. I think, unfortunately, God has a lot of baggage for us that we can't un necessarily uncover. Maybe because of prayers, like when a ton of Tokef. Right. We, uh, it's, it's we have difficult. to say, yeah, it's, it's difficult. difficult. It's difficult after the Holocaust, frankly. It's difficult yeah. to mm -hmm. talk about God in a certain way after the Holocaust. What, what's interesting is that on this mission, uh, one of the Catholic clergy turned to me and he said, Chaim, I don't understand what it means when you say there's an atheist Jew. He <laughs> says, in, in, in our community, if you're an right. atheist, you're not a Catholic. Right. How are you an atheist Jew? And I think that's one of the gateways. Yeah. Huh. That's one of the ways that we can really talk about how there is a holiness and there is a connection. It doesn't really matter if you're willing to say that I'm a Jew. Yeah. That itself is an act of holiness. Yeah. You just have to be wi mm -hmm. willing to be part of the Jewish conversation. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, if I could ask both of you to please email me your sermons a week before the high <laughs> holidays so I can steal all the things as I've stolen from both of you over the years. 
Um, it's so called sharing. 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 <laughs> Rabbi Share. We don't write. Um, so, so let's wrap up with something fun. A favorite high holiday tradition, whether it's your family or otherwise, what's just something that you do that, um, you know, it could be a recipe, it could be uh, something that happens at your table or otherwise, uh, something that, uh, a certain something that just brings joy to you with, on the holidays. Well, I've had the joy of spending Rosh Hashanah, you know, in, in rabbis' families, especially, you know, I love my husband, my Rebetzin, but he's not like the Rebetzin that's going to make the big holiday meal. So, um, and so our, it's, it's hard sometimes to feel like we get the kind of big holiday meals when I'm, when I'm the one making the holiday, in a sense, um, and not at, not at our table. So a kind of our biggest holiday meal, one of them, is um, after second day of Rosh Hashanah, we have a big, you know, even, you know, afternoon meal, and we um, and we do our tashlich, and and it's just, and we're with a very large group of people, including Rabbi Rick Jacobs, who has been um, was my earlier mentor from decades ago, and spend it with his family. Now we're on over two decades that we've been doing this, and um, you know, we 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 all throw our sins in, and we share them out loud, actually, with each other. And anyone who wants to agree can throw it in, and it's just kind of hmm. there's just a, a, a sense of uh, really understanding the kind of collectiveness of our you know imperfections in the world when we do it together. And there's a a trust and a community feel that's it's, it's one of my favorite traditions. Yeah, I, I'm gonna go old school on this. I I love wearing a kittel. Wow. I love wearing the, the, the white cloak on, on, uh, on Yom Kippur. Uh, it, it has lots of personal connections, but uh, the idea of, of, of wearing a kittel is that there's this certain difference mm. to the day. And, it, and you kind of put it on and you feel like, okay, now something different is happening. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to, to experience Yom Kippur just a little bit, even before Yom Kippur starts. Thank you. You? Um, you didn't answer. Yeah, I, so mine isn't unique to the Cosgroves. It's actually a very traditional custom of schlogging caparas, um, which is they do um, that? the, well, not with the chicken. So <laughs> okay. there was a tradition that one uh, swings a chicken around the head that takes on the sins and you donate it to um, uh, someone in need of food right before you go to synagogue on Yom Kol Nidre, on Yom Kippur evening. But in the, in the Cosgrove household, um, we always uh, get out a checkbook and throughout the year we make whatever other charitable donations um, we make, but, but the message of the Haftorah on Yom Kippur Day is that don't fast if you haven't attended to the hungry. You know, it's not yeah. about afflicting the soul, it's about caring for, for those on the margins of society. And so we have a big debate at our table and it's like a game because we say whatever the number is on the check we have to come to a resolution as to who receives it that year and so one kid says the environment another kid says feminist causes another kid says jewish causes another says reproductive or whatever the cause is um, but we all have to come to a conclusion and then we walk to synagogue and on the way to synagogue, we drop it in the mailbox. Beautiful. Um, Love it. And so just to remind us as a family that um, before we go into this day of, 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 of Yom Kippur, that um, we've, we've done something to, to heal the world. Beautiful. Well, as we wrap up, I want to first deeply thank my, my colleagues. Um, we started out with the question of what we do to prepare, and in some ways, this hour together might have been the way that I really felt that I've prepared <laughs> my, my heart and soul for Elul in a beautiful, different way, and I hope that we've helped you do the same. I wanna thank JBS for creating an opportunity, like a platform, for us to reach a very wide audience, and we hope that you join us for this and other programs that are happening on JBS. And, um, and we want to thank all of you for being a part of our extended family and community um, to join us for holidays, uh, our community's live stream, and that we really wish you a meaningful and um, joyful and healthy um, and awe-filled holiday season. Shana Tova.
שנה טובה. שנה טובה.